34 African nations are signatories to the Rome Statute more than any other continent. But the number of African voices critical of the International Criminal Court is steadily increasing. It's been called anti-African, accused of losing direction. And now South Africa has announced their intention to pull out completely. So if one nation goes, will the rest of the continent follow suit? And what would be implications on African justice post-ICC? I'm Beatrice Marshall. Welcome to Talk Africa. Now, African nations account for almost one-third of states to sign the Rome Statute. But African cases have dominated the ICC's caseload and the results have been mixed. The first successful conviction by the ICC was Congolese warlord Thomas Lubanga Dilo. His lengthy trial began in 2009 and three years later, he was sentenced to 14 years in prison. And in March 2013, former militia leader Bosco Ntaganda handed himself in. He's been charged with 13 counts of war crimes and the prosecution began presenting its evidence in September. Sudanese President Omar al-Bashir is wanted for alleged war crimes in Darfur. But in December of last year, the ICC prosecutor Fatou Bensouda halted investigations, criticizing the UN Security Council for failing to push for his arrest. Perhaps the best-known setback for the ICC was the case involving Kenyan President Uhuru Kenyatta. He was charged back in 2011 for alleged crimes against humanity perpetrated during the violence that followed Kenya in the 2007 elections. The ICC prosecutor later withdrew that, citing a lack of evidence. The case was terminated in March of this year. Now, coming up next month is what's likely to be an ICC highlight. Former Cote d'Ivoire, President Laurent Bagbo and his ally Charles Blair Goode are accused of four counts of crimes against humanity allegedly committed during post-election violence between 2010 and 2011. Their trial is scheduled to open on the 10th of November. But now South Africa's ruling party, the ANC, has announced their intention to withdraw the country from the ICC altogether, saying they believe the court has lost direction. CCTV's Yolisa Njamela filed this report. Africa's perception of the International Criminal Court has been souring over recent months. There was the case against Kenyan President Uhuru Kenyatta and the case against Omar al-Bashir for war crimes and crimes against humanity. That got South Africa in trouble with the court when it hosted the Sudanese leader without arresting him this year. Now, it looks like South Africa and the ICC are to part ways, according to Deputy Minister Obet Mapela. He was speaking at the ruling ANC's National General Council, a meeting attended by the president. Announcing a withdrawal from the ICC is a significant move for the ANC. The ANC says several steps need to take place before that can happen. But once it does, it could mean other African nations will soon follow suit. Yodisan Jamela, CCTV, Midrand, South Africa. While South Africa's exit from the ICC will not happen overnight, there are legal implications for that action. The ruling African National Congress says that this will be discussed at a meeting with the body next month. Yulisa Njamela sat down with party spokesperson Keith Khoza to find out the rationale behind the decision. Well, the NGC took a decision that the government must start the process of reviewing its uh, uh, affiliation to the Rome Statute. Uh, in view of the fact that uh, the current position adopted by ICC seems to be targeting African leaders much to the exclusion of everybody else. In so doing, the ANC is encouraged to do the re review in conjunction with the African Union so that uh, at the end when it has exhausted all the avenues, it can then withdraw but it would not do so almost immediately. It will undertake that process. So if you look at the cases that ICC has handled, they seem to be punitive only to African leaders. It's not the case with uh, Western countries who have had invasion of Iraq by Americans. ICC is quite on the matter. 
So uh, it does not look like it is interested in resolving conflicts the world over, but it has been used as well as a tool for regime change in the continent. When heads of state visit the United Nations, they are granted immunity by America, and ICC respects that. But when a head of state visits South Africa and is at the invitation of the African Union, and given all the necessary immunities by our country, they ignore that. So we see double standards in how the ICC operates. And it is up to the ICC to either reconsider its stance, which uh, uh, is punitive to Africans, and be much more open, and where we see equal treatment of countries the world over. Uh, if they fail to do that clearly, it means it leaves us where we are, where Africans are the only victims of the ICC. The alternative for us is to strengthen the African institutions of, of, of justice to ensure that uh, uh, Africans can resolve their issues as well through similar courts like an African Court of Justice. <laughs> We are going to take a short break now, but when we come back, my expert guests will help unpack Africa and the ICC to stay with us. The African Union member states have actually expressed their indignation regarding the way in which uh, some of the member states or the leaders of uh, Africa have been treated by the ICC and the chairperson of the African Union Commission has had the opportunity to voice out clearly the double standard nature that the ICC has been treating issues of international justice concerning the African continent. The African Union doesn't condone uh, impunity, but that uh, leaders of our continent who may be responsible for violations of human rights will have to be accountable at some point in time. And that message uh, should also be very clearly made out there. Well, that was the African Union Commission spokesperson, Jacob Eno Iben, outlining the body's views on the International Criminal Court. Welcome back to Talk Africa. Now, to help unpack this issue further, I have expert guests standing by in Nairobi, Dr. David Matsanga. He's a lawyer and conflict resolution expert. In Johannesburg, Wayne Nkube. He's the head of the Detention Monitoring Unit at Lawyers for Human Rights. And in The Hague, joining us from there, Michael Liu. He's the executive director at the Chinese Initiative on International Law. Gentlemen, thank you all for joining in the conversation. Uh, Wayne Nkube in Johannesburg, I'll start off with you, though. South South Africa has announced this week plans to withdraw from the Rome Statute from the International Criminal Court. First, as Africa's powerhouse, did this catch you by surprise? Are you surprised by this development? What's your reaction? Well, so it's not too much of a surprise here in South Africa because uh, there has been a lot of uh, negative talk uh, against the ICC from the ruling party, and there have been two recent court cases which have come down uh, putting the government of South Africa on the wrong side of uh, the law in terms of its obligations uh, regarding the Rome Statute. And a few months ago, the uh, ANC government had already spoken about possible plans to pull out of the ICC. So it is not so much of a shock, uh, but it is definitely a move, a disheartening move for uh, people who would like to see international criminal justice uh, take root in Africa. Right. Uh, David in Nairobi? Yes. Is this a surprise? It is not a surprise that we expected it because most of us who have campaigned against the ICC intervention in African uh, uh, situations have said that they have done little to, 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 to save, to create the peace that they come to create on the continent. So it didn't surprise me because I was, in fact, to be very frank, I was, I'm happy with what South Africa has done 
because South Africa has got institutions. Judicial institutions in Af South Africa are firm. They can take decisions on the question of any human rights abuses. They have made decisions. So to, for South Africa to continue to be in the ICC, when in actual sense the ICC is actually bringing more impunity uh, by, by, by doing uh, fakeness of cases on African continent right. is not uh, called for. Mark Liu, your comments on that? It is not a surprise if this is from, because this is from Africa, some countries have been challenging the memberships in the ICC, but I'm a little bit surprised this is coming out of South Africa, one of the most progressive countries in terms of uh, advance of international human rights and international justice. So, yes, I'm a little bit surprised. Uh, Michael, though, the South Africa's ruling uh, National Congress at the time when it announced that pullout, they did say, though, that the ICC had lost its direction. It no longer was an instrument that is fair to everybody. Do you agree with that, though? <laughs> I'm not sure. Uh, if we're looking well, on this specific debate on ICC and Africa, two days ago the OTP just announced that the request for investigation in, in Georgia, uh, the first if it succeeded, that the first investigation outside Africa, if that is a direction, I guess that is a good direction for this debate. But I think in general, um, I wouldn't say the ICC has lost its direction in total. I'd say that ICC is still trying to be there, be the very, independ very first independent international judicial body outside the United Nations to serve its mandate. So it's still trying. It has some problems but uh, I wouldn't say it totally lost its direction. David, the ICC has some problems, but has not completely lost the direction. Do you agree? On African cases, it has. On all cases, on the African continent, Beatrice and Michael, it has lost direction. Look at all cases, Libya, Central African Republic, Congo, Uganda first case, the Kenyan case, they lost direction. They came, investigated, took one side. The Uganda case is more peculiar in the sense that they investigated both sides and they decided to take one side. The Congo case is worse. Bemba is facing trial, right. but we did not carry, we did not take the president of Central African Republic who invited Bemba. So the ICC has the office of the chief prosecutor. It is not that Africa does not like ICC. Africa says the office of the chief prosecutor has flowed investigations in all African situations. Right. David, though, just to come back to that, though, in this whole question of losing direction, what does South Africa or Africa mean by saying that the ICC has lost the direction in Africa? Yes, it means when you actually investigate, you come and you are told this, you don't use the flawed uh, NGOs that are in Africa. You come to do an investigation. The question of Bashir, this was a very clear indication by the African Union to say peace has returned in Darfur. Bashir is a head leading, is a head of state in Africa. He has got to be given credentials. When AU sits in, New, in South Africa, right. you cannot arrest Bashir from South Africa because AU has shifted its headquarters to South Africa. So why South Africa is quitting? And I'm not only South Africa. I would right. like to tell you, Beatrice, many countries are going to follow South Africa, except Botswana, that has hiccups. But most of the African countries are going to follow suit because we have a good... David, I'm, I'm going to interrupt you there, though, and get a Wayne's view on this because David does say that uh, many countries, many African countries are going to follow South Africa out, out of the IC, the Rome Statute. Wayne... What do you think will be the implication if indeed South Africa does uh, continue and pull out of the Rome Statute? What will be the knockoff effect? Well, right now I don't think we can uh, speculate on whether or not the rest of the African continent is going to withdraw from the ICC. I think we have to look at it in isolation as what has happened in South Africa, which has put it in a bad light in the world because of its failure to... Uh, complete its international obligations and its national obligations in terms of the Rome Statute. You will have to remember in South Africa we have a constitution and the provisions of the Rome Statute are, are uh, binding to South African authorities because of uh, legislation which was 
enacted by South African Parliament saying they have to comply. Uh, so I think it is a very different situation than just looking at it as if it's a whole African context. The South African uh, situation has to be looked at in its uh, own situation. Now, in 2013, there was a motion at the AU for, to lead a mass walkout of the, out of the ICC, and most of the African countries rejected this resolution, and they are still uh, willing to uh, deal with the International Criminal Court and uh, I think have the concerns that they have uh, raised in amendments to the Rome Statute. Uh, a lot of the concerns can be dealt with by simply amending the actual statute which binds the court rather than just pulling out of the court and leaving nothing in its place. Right. And Michael Liu, though, that whole question of what happens if South Africa moves out of the ICC, what happens to Africa? What's your take on that? What happened in South Africa is uh, I think people are showing their dissatisfaction against the court uh, for whatever reason it is. That is all we have our opinions. Everyone deserves to express our opinions. Uh, if you're asking me about if the South African will pull out of the court, I'm not sure. I'm not a political analyst. But I, I agree with Wayne. Like We have seen this before, and it's a very, very difficult thing to achieve if the politicians in South Africa wants to, wants to realize that. And I do think um, the African countries, if they disagree with the court or disagree with certain organs of the court, they have a proper platform to negotiate with, with the whoever they want to enter into discussion with. They have assembly of state parties. African countries still has one third of all the member states of the International Criminal Court. That is a very strong bargaining power. All right, uh, David, that's a very uh, interesting uh, argument that's coming out there that uh, African countries had tried previously, uh, you know, for a mass walkout, but some of them, some African countries rejected. Do you think there are other avenues that Africa can have their issues addressed other we than walking out en masse? Do you think Africa will walk out en masse? Michael, Beatrice, and my colleague from The Hague, all avenues have been tried. Why we did not walk out the other time is we put a memorandum to the president of the state parties requesting for the OTP to be changed so that the powers of the chief prosecutor are changed to last year in 2013 in The Hague we had a consensus on rule 68 I was a participant I took part in The, in the Hague uh, ASP we agreed that Rule 68 will not be used on Kenyan case. This was a general agreement. When we came out of the ASP right. and we arrived in Kenya and other countries, this Rule 68, again, when it went to court, it was used. So this time, we have said we were beaten once, twice we are shy. <laughs> once beaten, twice shy. I'm going to cut you off there, though, because I want to get the input here from Wayne in Cuba. You, you've heard the sentiments uh, from David there, uh, Wayne, and you're listening to this from Johannesburg. Though, is there a lot of frustration from where you are? Are you feeling the frustration of the continent regarding the work of the International Criminal Court, or these are just political sentiments coming out of Africa's leadership? I think th there is frustration around uh, what we've heard, a lot of the rhetoric that we've heard in South Africa is around the unwillingness to listen to uh, debates around head of state immunity. Now, if we look at the Rome Statute, uh, Section 27 very clearly uh, indicates that, uh, that uh, the fact that someone is a head of state, it literally puts that wording into the act, does not make you immune from, from the law. Now, in our own legislation here in South Africa, we have similar legislation which says uh, those which has that exact same provision. And then if we look at Bashir's situation, I think we also have to remember in both Libya and Bashir, uh, th those were referrals by the Security Council of the United Nations. And in those cases, South Africa voted for that referral. Tanzania voted for the Libyan referral. Nigeria and Gabon also voted. Uh, in terms of referring matters to the International Criminal Court and Algeria abstained from voting. They did not vote against it. 
So I think whenever we have a look at the International Criminal Court, we, we have to be careful with what we're saying, we're criticizing it for, because Africa has uh, willingly right. referred five matters to it. They have voted for resolutions to send matters to the court, and they signed an act which uh, took away head of state impunity. And obviously now there are negotiations to backtrack that. But then that then has to be done with, in terms of the act. The Act has got provisions for how amendments should be done. Amendments should right. not be done when, oh, now you're facing a case, now this particular individual is in trouble, now we want him to be above the law. No, those amendments should be, uh, you can't change the law for a specific person, or rather say, no, we don't want to use right. this part of the law just because this person is now in this situation. David, I see you're shaking your head there, though. Uh, there there, there uh, is, yes, uh, let me make clarification he here. Resolution 1970, uh, yes, South Africa voted for the bombardment of Libya. I think South Africa did not vote for ICC referral. That is wrong. Let, let me come back to the point that uh, Michael has made. AU put a raft of measures. One, that the sitting head of state in any of the African countries should not be taken to the ICC until its term of office comes to an end. These are the proposals. We are also reasoning. We have not said we don't like ICC on the content, but we reasoned with the, the ASP right. and the ICC that any sitting head of state in Africa should be allowed to finish his term of office. Then after that, if there is anything that he has committed while in office can be tr he can be tried but what AU was opposed to is to how a sitting head of state that's why we went with this proposal to the Hague and in the SP and I put it before them and the two we suggested very briefly David we suggested that reforms the, the chief prosecutor is the investigator the prosecutor almost becomes the judge we wanted the office of the OTP to be separated into several other parts. These reforms have not come, Beatrice. And three, the flawed type of David. investigations that we have is what has caused us in Africa to have this content about the ICC totally. David, I want to broaden this uh, very briefly yes. because we are running out of time. But I just want to broaden this b very briefly and start with Michael. Michael, uh, you have mentioned previously that any international justice, though, because we are discussing Africa's alternative mechanisms or, or, or favorism or whatever you can call it, any international justice without China's participation will not be a true global effort. What do you mean by that? Well, China is a very important global power, a very responsible global power. In the discussions we just had on the Libya situation, on the Sudan situation, China did, China did join the discussion in the Security Council, voted for one and vo absent another one. So they let it go, the, the situation, let the situation go to the court. China did participate in that discussion. If China is not there, I don't think that will be a true global effort. In that specific s example, I think in this whole discussion, China should be participating as well. We are, the Chinese investment, also our nationals are all over Africa. Whether the court is making Africa safe, that is a matter of true concern to Chinese interests and Chinese nationals like me, Chinese lawyers like me. I really, I really believe that, and I think our discussions contribute to that as well. Well, uh, Michael, though, I as you watch this, though, uh, uh, unfolding, uh, as you watch the debate on Africa and the ICC, and, of course, alternative forms of justice for uh, the African continent, what do you think China's role should be, though? Well, China can be a mediator in this debate, like we're doing at now CCTV. If there is anger from Africans toward the ICC, which allegedly has been accused of manipulated by the West or most of the European countries, China could start can be a mediator, can host discussions, can join the discussions as well. I think that is a very key role to play. You are a big power. You are not part of this whole, whole debate. It does not have, you don't have direct interest in this that much. I think it's very, it can play a very constructive role to reflect what African countries, their, their uh, dissatisfactions to the stakeholders of ICC itself. 
And that's, th that is a very important contribution from China. All right. Uh, Wayne, in Johannesburg, do you think this has become a one-sided vendetta against the continent? Is Africa's anger at the International Criminal Court justified? Well, uh, like I said, I think you would obviously have to look at exactly what the resolutions which have been passed against uh, the ICC at the AU level are. But what we should remember is that the ICC, from its statute, is envisaged as a court of last resort in any uh, uh, case. In other words, it is uh, meant to adhere to the principle uh, of complementarity, which means that matters should only be ending up there when there is no other recourse. Now, if Africa were able to have its own court, uh, the current talk has obviously been about the African Court on Human and People's Rights having an, an international criminal division. If it were able to have that division there, uh, which is fully operational, but there are a lot of challenges before that, uh, something like that would ever be in place, uh, then n all the matters should not be going to, ICC, to the ICC. Technically, states should be prosecuting these matters themselves, and when, where they cannot, if there's an African mechanism which is in place, then let that be the, the venue. But then it's important to understand that victims require justice. And if the ICC is the last resort, then the victims should have their say at the ICC. And if we need to make it better in some way, then let us engage in honest dialogue to ensure that that happens. But what we cannot do is then just renege on our obligations in terms of uh, ending impunity in the absence of uh, the ICC. David, in 30 seconds, you have the final word. ICC has usurped complementarity status that uh, Michael is talking about, or uh, Wayne is talking about. Complementarity status of ICC has, they have usurped the national uh, courts, have no say. But let me take this opportunity to say to the chief prosecutor, in most of the cases that were handled in Africa, 90% of the cases were fake. When they were faked, the, 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 the investigations were flawed. It is very important, as enshrined in the Roman Statute, and Article 53 of the Roman Statute, once the chief prosecutor finds that the cases don't, don't, don't deserve to be in the court, she has a mandate, or he has a mandate, to withdraw such cases. Look at the cases where we right. have a, a, a lot of uh, accusations and counter-accusations of fixing, coaching, bribery, intimidation, killing of witnesses. Such cases could be thrown out of the court to keep the credibility of the ICC. That is why most of the African countries, especially the AU, under the ban of AU, are not happy when they hear of investigations being uh, flawed. What, right, has, David. what do we do to the chief prosecutor who has flawed investigations? That is my last word. That's your last word, David. And that's all we have time for this weekend. Thank you to my guests for your insights. Dr. David Matsanga in Nairobi, Wayne Kube in Johannesburg, and Michael Liu in The Hague. Remember, you can join in the conversation online through Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. And do join us again next week for another edition of Talk Africa. Goodbye.